It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator, Ed Opperman. Uh, you can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting by emailing me at oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. Uh, also, too, be sure to check out our Patreon. We put up a, a ton of new content each month on Patreon. And Spreaker.com is where you can find all of our archives for free. Uh, you get an email notification anytime we put up new content. And there's also a chat room in there, too, that you can discuss with other listeners. Keep an eye out. I'm doing an interview with Joshua Phillip for the Epoch Times, uh, the Crossroads podcast about the Ghislaine Maxwell trial. Uh, we're taping that on Monday, so I'll let you know when we're going to be playing it, well, when they're going to be playing it. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. I've got a really exciting show for you today. I've been talking to our guest already for about an hour before the show even started, Jonathan Mitchell, okay, uh, who's written a book called... Um, before Son of Sam, The Submerged History of a Yonkers Cult. Uh, so he's become quite an expert on the Son of Sam cult and the Process Church. We just spent about an hour talking off the air. Uh, Mr. Jonathan Mitchell, are you there? Yeah, right here. Thank you so much, my friend. Tell the audience about yourself. Who is Jonathan Mitchell? Okay, well, I'm, I'm an author. Um, I started out as a fiction author, so I've, I've written a, a horror novel and a, uh, that I've self-published, as well as a couple of stories that were published by... Uh, various small presses, uh, and I've been writing fiction for a long time, but I had always been interested in the Son of Sam case because I'd read Maury Terry's book, and um, a few years ago, um, I decided to undertake a little research just to see what I could find, and um, yeah, I wound up finding some pretty interesting material and, and uh, uh, you know, in some cases, even real names of the people that... that Maury Terry talked about because he, as our listeners probably know, he assigned aliases to a lot of the, the suspects in that book. And um, so in, in a lot of cases, I was able to find real names and uh, real information about the people who, who played a role in, in the cult and its activities. And uh, finally, I just decided I had to, like a something that was like long essay length, and I just thought I would self-publish it and, and put it out there and see if it got any interest and I was really pleasantly surprised. People seemed to, to want to read about the case and talk about it again. And it's uh, in the two years since the book has been out, it's, it's uh, gotten a generally really positive reaction. Now, in the description on Amazon, and by the way, this book's got great reviews on Amazon, uh, you say that you, you previously wrote a fictionalized account called The Agent. Would you recommend people purchase The Agent, too, as well, in order to, to get a, a grasp on what you're trying to tell people? Um, I, it, it's not really necessary if they just want to read the, the Son of Sam book, but they, they can. But it's uh, there definitely are things that if they read The Agent, they will recognize um, aspects of the Son of Sam case, as well as Manson and, and, and some other uh, uh, cultural phenomena like that, you know, from the 60s and 70s. But, but they will, if they read the novel, they'll, they'll, they'll recognize some, some parallels in, in the story with, with, with these real-life situations. So now, most people listening to this show right now, they, they haven't Googled Son of Sam and found the show on YouTube or, or iHeart or iTunes. They're driving along in their car, okay, and they hear Son of Sam. Well, didn't they solve that case of Son of Sam? I saw the Spike Lee movie. He was talking to a dog. Uh, what? <laughs> that, okay, that, somehow that crazy story <laughs> came out. That's like, why don't you give us first, what's the official story of Son of Sam and what have you and Maury Terry and many other great researchers like Dave McGowan and, like you said, William Ramsey and Cisco Street Love and um, uh, Russ Dizdar and, and er, Ed Sanders and, and all these people ha have discovered? Uh, tell the official story first and then what's the real story? Right. Well, the official story goes that uh, the uh, the Son of Sam attacks, uh, which were a series of shootings in, in the various boroughs of, of New York in 1976 and 77, that they were all committed by one man, and he was a resident of Yonkers. His name was David Berkowitz, and uh, Berkowitz was arrested in August of 1977 and uh, pretty shortly thereafter confessed to having done all the shootings. 
so that he uh, there was never a trial. You know, there was no uh, uh, evidence presented that he was guilty. Uh, it, 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 but he confessed to all the shootings and is uh, spending life in prison. Um, and he claims that that the uh, the dog of a, of a neighbor of his in Yonkers instructed him to do these shootings and and uh, so unfortunately that has become the, the version of events that people generally believe um, and it's true you, you do it when, whenever you discuss this case you you have to first uh, disabuse people of that notion and it, that can be very difficult um, but but the reality is as, as Maury Terry the late investigative journalist found and, and published in his book the ultimate evil uh, the case was considerably more complicated than that, and Berkowitz was a member of a Yonkers cult uh, with connections to an English organization called the Process Church. But but this this was a violent cult. Um, they had um, at least, uh, according to Berkowitz, a couple of dozen members in their inner circle in the mid to late 70s when these these crimes were committed. And um, Berkowitz later um, told Maury Carey that there were a number of shooters, that he was just one, and that, in fact, he had only done two of the shootings. Um, and the rest could be attributed to other people who, who also were members of the cult. Um, and, and there actually is overwhelming evidence that this is the case. There are you know various interviews and police reports and, and to indicate that that the cult theory is correct, and in fact, uh, I forget what year it was, but at one point, the Queens District Attorney John Santucci was about to reopen the investigation, and and had already offered his opinion that 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 this data was valid, and that there was reason to inv- reinvestigate Son of Sam as uh, a multiple shooter conspiracy. Um, but this uh, this reinvestigation was later shut down now in, in 1996 I believe or 97 uh, Yonkers Police Department reopened the investigation and I believe it officially is still open but but of course sadly we haven't seen a lot of progress made there at least not uh, that's ever been aired publicly and, and um, unfortunately Maury Terry died in 2015 so um uh, 2017 marked the 40th anniversary of Berkowitz's arrest, and, and it seemed at the time that, that, that people had sort of generally accepted that he was the only killer and that there was nothing to the cult story, and, and everybody had sort of uh, closed the books on the case. But um, I, I found that much to my surprise, I was pleasantly surprised that people did still want to talk about the case and, and the, the evidence that a cult was to blame specifically. So, so there's been a lot of really lively discussion in the past couple of years, and it's, um, it's, it's been exciting to be a part of it. Yeah, if pe- most people that, that listen to this show um, are aware that, that I've been covering this topic since 2013, the first year we started doing this show, and we've had Detective Jim Rothstein on the show who, who investigated these cases uh, for a special unit, uh, NYPD. Uh, we've had Joe Ferrara, who was uh, uh, associated with the victims of this cult. We've had Carl De Niro several times on the show, who was actually shot in the head by the son of Sam. Um, we've had um, William Ramsey, Cisco Street Love, Dave McGowan, all, all researchers who have uh, just about every author that's written a book about this show. And until recently, there's been no real debate uh, about a, a smaller cult, right? A smaller cult, the 22 children in Yonkers. And the involvement of, the, like you said, this nationwide and international cult, beginning in England, the, the Process Church of the Final Judgment. What do you make about recent um, – I did a whole show about the revisionism uh, and the rewriting of history, and, and where even right. David Berkowitz came out and wrote a letter in support of Maury Terry w- within the past couple of months, okay, after a recent documentary came public. What, what do you make in this shift, this revisionism? Well, it- <sighs> It's a funny thing because, you know, the the, the process theology as it originally existed, I mean, they, they were openly, um, I mean, I hesitate to call it theology even because it, it was really just this, this dangerous stew of stuff about them. I mean, they were, they were openly sympathetic to the Nazis.
Nazis, they use Nazi symbology. You know, you, you saw swastikas or variants of swastikas in, in the designs of their, their organization logos and their magazines and everything. And, and they were they were very, I mean, it, it was obvious that what they were talking about was was harmful and it, and it was intentionally so. And they, they, they were talking about... Um, um, creating chaos within society to, to hasten Armageddon and, and things like this, you know, so, so they were, they claim now that they were, you know, woefully misinterpreted, but, but with the kind of, of ideas they were peddling at the time, I don't see how it can be misinterpreted. There's really not a way to put a positive spin on, on the, the, the stuff that they were talking. They were talking about violence and they were talking about, uh, the destruction of society, you know, and, and later, of course, in the, in, later in the 70s, they had to try to rebrand themselves because the, the general reaction from the public and the media had been so negative. And, and so for them to say now that, that, gee, really, we were harmless and, and, and we didn't mean to hurt anybody or to scare anybody, and, and we were just misinterpreted. We were just a... Uh, a self-actualization, self-realization group. It, it really is. It, I don't find that at all uh, sympathetic or, or convincing that, that, that they're trying to whitewash what they did now. So, would you say that their philosophy was very similar to the son, uh, to a Charles Manson, uh, Armageddon, uh, uh, helter skelter, uh, end of the world chaos cause? Let, let's bring on, let's bring it on. Uh, and, oh, they, and, very definitely, yeah, right, yeah. They, they, and not only that, but they were. You know, being an, uh, an English organization as they were, um, the process right around the time that they started, there were some strange theories being discussed and some strange research being conducted at, at the Tavistock Institute in England. Uh, there was a, a, um, a researcher named, was it uh, Trist, uh, who was associated with the Tavistock Institute, which uh, emerged out of the, the United Kingdom's uh, War Propaganda Bureau, but he was talking in the early 60s um, about uh, the same sort of uh, sustained societal chaos mm. and about how uh, a series of traumatic events could be staged um, that long term would have a negative effect on society and people's ability to reason and that people could be steered in different directions on the basis of the, this sustained chaos. Uh, and this, this research was being conducted at Tavistock in 1962, 63, right on the eve of the formation of the process. And I, I don't think it's coincidence that just a few years later, we find the process sort of peddling that same agenda. Um, I, I think they did have connections to to uh, British intelligence and military intelligence, and of course also to the CIA, uh, because there was a, a long uh, and uh, pretty gruesome uh, history of, of a relationship between the CIA and, and the research being conducted at Tavistock. And for people who say, oh, my goodness, Mr. Mitchell, being so far-fetched here. Now you've gone too far. <laughs> okay. uh, is it really too far? Alistair Crowley had, uh, what was it, MI6 or MI5? I always get those two confused. Uh, he had a, a, a history with them. So did uh, L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, we had John, right. uh, the head of uh, NASA, JPL, uh, John Parsons, Jack Parsons, was a avowed Satanist, public Satanist. Uh, we had Colonel Michael Aquino, who was uh, the head of the Temple of Set, who was the, the first Satanic chaplain uh, in the U.S. Army that went to high rank and high prestige uh, in his military career using psychological, wrote books on psychological warfare. Uh, so all of this is not as far-fetched. If you if you delve in and people who are familiar with this topic and are searching out this topic and finding it uh, would be familiar with. Right, that, it, it's all uh, it's all documented. It, it's, it's it can all be pointed to as, as established uh, fact for for the public record. Um, in fact, this this researcher I was talking about at Tavistock, Eric Trist, um, he he and his colleagues wrote uh, papers and and books on this subject. Uh, uh, the, the subject of social turbulence and, and about how uh, society could be remolded uh, more to uh, the liking of the ruling class uh, by, by uh, staging one traumatic 
public event after another, and and this is exactly the kind of of uh, uh, agenda that was being peddled just a, a few years later by the process and by the Manson family, and and um, it, it's uh, it sounds it, it does sound far fetched, you know, in the context of just a casual conversation, but but again, and and I have uh, I address some of this stuff towards the end of my book. Um, it's all documented it can all be very easily verified you know uh, uh, it, it's no secret that, that this kind of, of uh, research was being peddled as as a good thing as, as a as a proposal that that might uh, address uh, a lot of problems you know it, 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 the, the researchers and and um, a lot of people in positions of power saw this as, as a positive thing it's something that they wanted to happen at least theoretically you know I'm, I'm sure they wouldn't have come out and said uh, yes, we want to inflict total chaos on human society, but but they they did that they were uh, very much in favor, generally speaking, of, of, of this kind of research. And, and just uh, especially during that period of time, we, it wasn't just the son of Sam. We, we had other serial killers uh, who had nicknames and public attention, writing and, and communicating with the newspapers and the media, taunting the police. Uh, everyone knew about them. Everybody was afraid of them. We had the smiley face killers nationwide. We had the Atlanta child killers. There were a lot of things going on, okay, that, that are right along this same theme. Uh, the murder of Arliss Perry, uh, all these things. And, and Maury, and his, Maury Terry, uh, the author of the book, The Ultimate Evil, uh, kind of threaded a link between all these different cases and people. So has uh, uh, many others. Uh, Jim Rossi and the NYPD detective who investigated these things. Uh, why do you think there is suddenly um, a pretty big public push uh, to separate the 22 children, the local cult in Yonkers, from this nationwide international cult? It's an interesting question, and I'm, I'm not sure how uh, uh, this idea developed that it, that it would be a good thing to mm. um, to say that, that Son of Sam essentially was confined to the immediate area and that it was more or less a regional phenomenon and, and didn't have connections to any larger groups or, or organizations. I'm not sure how that idea developed. Now, I've spoken to people and, in fact, have briefly even worked with other uh, um Investigators and researchers who, who maybe were more inclined to this idea that well we we can basically confine this to Yonkers. Mm. Um, now, unfortunately, that's that's just not the case because those the, the researchers I just mentioned, they have seen as I have seen, um, definitive evidence that the Process Church were involved. Now, there, there absolutely was a pre-existing cult in Yonkers that goes back to at least the early 1950s. I, I would argue that, that there were there was strange activity mm -hmm. in the city even decades before that, that that could point to some, you know, earlier, uh, to some existence of, of an earlier incarnation of the cult, but, but they go back to at least the early 50s. Um, they, they were more of a... Um, and, and I'm sure people will be familiar with this. They were initially described as like sort of a ritual magic club. It was, uh, you know, like wealthy people, doctors and, and um, attorneys and judges and so forth looking for kicks. And, and they, they were, I mean, the, the evidence indicates that they were into um, children and, and, you know, I mean, and, and there were drugs and, and that sort of thing around too. But, but they weren't really um, oriented toward violence. Um, that happened later when the leaders of the Process Church settled in Westchester County in 1972. And the cult that already existed in Yonkers became affiliated with the Process, and it appears that the Process began to call the shots mm. so that uh, its activity, the, the Yonkers cult's activities were dictated by the Process agenda at that point. And there, there is, as I said, definitive evidence that when the Son of Sam shootings were planned in the spring of 1976, that process leaders were in attendance at that meeting. There were members of the Yonkers cult there, including its leadership, but there were also leaders of the process who were there. Now, 
David Berkowitz has made that claim too in, in Maury Terry's book, and he's absolutely right. And and when I say the leaders of the process were at this meeting to plan the Son of Sam attacks, that means exactly what it, it seems to mean. The, the leaders were there. It, it wasn't just a few rogue members. It wasn't people who had departed from the main body of, of the process church. It was literally the leaders of the process who were present at this meeting when the Son of Sam attacks were being planned. So I think that's something that, particularly for the general public who may not understand the details of this case and the investigation, that needs to be made clear uh, that the process were extensively involved in the Son of Sam case from the beginning. Let, let, let me, let's clarify this for people listening. Sure. You have seen with your own eyes documentation from Maury Terry's files claiming that the leadership of the Process Church was there at the planning of the Son of Sam cult murders. I have, yes. And okay. I, I, unfortunately, I can't be more specific than that. But yes, the, the leadership of the Process Church were there when, when the Son of Sam attacks were being planned. And, and when you describe, you're saying, well, there's this new found, these new researchers and these new investigators, you're really talking about YouTubers, right? These are YouTubers with no background in investigation or research. They've never been hired to research anything besides perhaps botany. Well, there, there are. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, <laughs> there, are, there are other folks involved from different the uh, backgrounds and and uh, but but in particular we're talking about one quote unquote investigator who who yes he he does not really have any not that I, I am not a professional researcher myself I'm just a writer and an amateur researcher and I work with a, a number still he, he, uh, now a, a very good dedicated uh, researchers who are into this for the right reasons and and, and our our objective is always the same that we want to solve the case and and uh, hold the people accountable who are still alive who who are accountable for for the murders but there is one individual in particular and and he has you know friends and allies in this who uh yeah he really doesn't he he's not a researcher he has no background in research and he is presently peddling this notion that the process either were not involved in the case at all or there was at best minimal involvement and and right. he knows this to be untruthful he, he he is deliberately being dishonest about that oh because he's also seen that document you described he has okay now and also to you talk about the well this is a much larger operation it's gone back many many years to the 50s uh, untermeyer park itself uh, was built with all kind of all kind of occult symbolism and and by the yard loads, and each stone in that park was imported from England. So and and the the fellow Untermeyer was had something to do with creating the Federal Reserve. This was no slouch. This was like a real guy. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Untermeyer yeah. had his, his irons and some very important yeah. fires. Yeah. But it's just twenty two kids uh, with dogs in in a park pulling around. <laughs> I don't know why that seems more plausible to people, but apparently it does for, for some reason. And if you listen to Detective Jim Rothstein, retired NYPD, who now can currently, I believe, is still currently a mayor of, of a town uh, up there. I always forget where. Uh, but he, he talks about connections to, to Roy Cohen and investigating Roy Cohen's farm. I had another guest on this show, Richard Kerr, who was trafficked by Roy Cohen, uh, who has pictures uh, demonstrating this. Okay, it came out of that Kinkira Boys home over there in Ireland. Uh, Roy Raiden this multi-millionaire character over there in the Hamptons doing, getting away with it, whatever he wanted to do uh, all over the country because uh, his connections with his vaudeville show with police unions and, and PBA associations and all kind of stuff. They had people at Studio 54, right, and were, were all mentioned in Maury Terry's notes and documents and, and INS documents and, and uh, police reports. Right. That's right. What about some of the other things that were going around, uh, going on in New York City and Yonkers at this time? I understand there were uh, numer you cover in your book the fires, the arson. Yeah, the, there were a number of, of really odd and, and possibly unexplained uh, fires uh, that were reported routinely in, in the Yonkers Herald Statesman, the, the, the newspaper there that, that uh, is no longer in operation. But um, um, I found a number of, of odd fires that at least in a, a handful of, of cases could be connected with individuals who did or may have had some involvement with this earliest uh, 
incarnation of, of the, the local cult there. Um, now, as I say in the book, uh, th- this particular part of, of the story is, is conjecture on my part because I can't definitively link the fires to cult activity, but as, as people probably are aware, um, fires are an integral part of, of a cult. Yeah. activity you know you you, you have uh, fires are, are a sacrificial um, symbolic act you know and and if if there was a cult activity in the city that early on there there also would have been fires and and um it, it, it's the kind of scenario where a, a fire could easily get out of control and and um but I, I do detail that in the book. There's there's a brief chapter on that, and you know a lot of the reason that I include things like that in the book that are um, partially speculative is is in the hope that there is someone still alive who might remember some of this activity and might be able to come forward and confirm some of it and, and flesh out um, the, the theory that that that, that some of this stuff was attributable to to cult activity because th- there was this this was all right around the same time that um that Undermire Park uh was sort of deteriorating and that it became a hangout for drug users and mm. you know criminals and and um, um these this this crowd of, of strange dangerous characters you know and it's also the time that that the neighborhood where David Berkowitz and the Carr family lived in, in Yonkers, it, that the neighborhood itself was beginning to deteriorate. So um, you get a lot of activity that occurs right around the same time, which seems to indicate, uh, based on you know later events and, and things that, that, that were learned later, um, that, that the cult activity is tied in with the drug activity, which is tied into the general economic deterioration of that neighborhood and and with the the city too um so it was a very uh specific sort of situation in yonkers i I believe this this probably has happened in other american cities of of that size too but but in yonkers it was a really specific set of uh circumstances and a really specific backdrop and there absolutely was a cult there and and they were able to thrive uh, I, I think at least in part because of the specific circumstances and of, of what was happening in, in the city at the time. But, but they did, they had existed for at least a couple of, of decades before uh, becoming involved with, with the Process Church in 1972. You know, it's funny how you mentioned about the decay and, and the, the drug activity and the teenage uh, the mis, uh, mischief going on at these locations. Because right. uh, when I was growing up on Staten Island, right? Um, and as you know, one of the leaders of these cults later on moved to Staten Island. Um, right. And w- we had friends because in Staten Island there would be new uh, housing projects. They, they would chop down woods, you know, and, and they'd build uh, condominiums or row houses there. And a friend of mine moved into this new condominium, and she heard chanting and people in robes with a fire out in the woods behind her house. You know? She, yeah. Yeah, she, yeah. She called the cops. And they said, oh, maybe they're having a, a barbecue because they found that the animals <laughs> had been burned up in these fires. And so, well, maybe they're having a barbecue, the cops said. And she goes, what are you talking about? They're chanting. He says, listen, it's not illegal to, to have your kind of whatever religion you want to be out in the woods chanting and, and sacrificing animals. And that was the end of that. But there was something else that always struck me. Uh, the, on Staten Island, there was a Vanderbilt's tomb. Uh, Vander, Gloria Vanderbilt's father was this real multi-billionaire type guy and had this big giant tomb in the end of the cemetery. Uh, but for some reason, it was built in such a way that we all had access by climbing up this wall that was like steps that you can get to the roof. And once you got up there, it would be partying, smoking marijuana, drinking. Uh, and, and there was all kinds of uh, satanic graffiti and all kinds of things going up there. And it always struck my mind. How could it be someone this rich would let their gravesite be desecrated like this? It just makes no sense. You know, right. uh, yeah. So right. uh, again, that same that same kind of thing you're describing there about Huntermeyer Hunt- Park taking over by these uh, local uh, uh, misfits. You know, that's right. That's right. And and the activity uh, uh, so often seemed to occur around these old estates or right. cemeteries where people who had owned the estates were buried, and and it always seemed to revolve around. Um, extremely wealthy 
the uh, blue blood upper class old money sort of, of figures. Uh, yeah, that, that that is a key in in the in the larger uh, uh, story. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of money with this bunch. That's for sure. You can find our guest Jonathan Mitchell. You can find him through email. If you got any tips or something you want to send to him, uh, throwaways at yahoo dot com. That's his email address. Uh, we're talking to the author of the book called Before Son of Sam, The Submerged History of a Yonkers Cult. Now, Jonathan, off the air, just during the commercial break, we were chatting a bit. I think we talked more off the air than we do on. (laughs) We're going to have to uh, do a show for Patreon and just really get into all the gossip of all the stuff going on. Sure, that sounds good. Yeah, but people who are really fascinated with this topic. But you were telling me about someone named uh, Susan Conaway. What 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 can you tell us about this? She was involved in both the, the 22 and the process. She was, yeah, and, and she, she's an interesting figure because of that, because she shows how uh, uh, specific and and how um, uh, frightening in, in a lot of cases the, the interaction was between the Yonkers cult and, and the Process Church. Um, and I, this is somebody, that I don't know why I find her so interesting in particular, it's just that you see one photo of, of one of these old suspects, and there seems to be so much of the story that's unsaid that, that you just read in the expression on their on their face in, in the picture. Um, and she's somebody that I, I just initially ran across the name. I didn't know what her specific role in the cult was, but um, you know, the more I dug into newspaper records and read about her, uh, the more fascinating her story became, and, and, and sadder too, because she. I, I think this is true. A lot of the street level people who were involved in the Yonkers cult, they were poor kids. They came from a very poor, disadvantaged background that they uh, or like in, in Susan Conway's case, she had to deal with abuse at home. Um, she was always uh, uh, being knocked downstairs and, and uh, you know breaking an arm or an ankle or what. So, so when these kids became involved in the cult, I think it was often because it may have given them a sense of belonging. It may have been like a surrogate family, you know, something that, that they did not have access to in their own homes or, or anywhere else. And I think that, you know, I, I, I don't, unfortunately, I only talked to one person who, uh, in the course of my research, who, who was actually acquainted with her, but I've, I've tried to find other people. But but I, I believe, you know, if you look at all the, 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 the documentation of her life as it appears in the newspapers that she you know she embraced the cult and the cult embraced her and that it it, did serve the the function of like a a surrogate family i believe that probably was true for other members of the cult too but she she grew up very poor in 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 the mulford gardens housing project in yonkers and um you know by the time she was 17 or 18 she had like a petty arrest record, you know, she had stolen some things, I mean, just just small stuff, but but she became involved in more and more dangerous activity uh, to the point where, you know, her boyfriends were being arrested by the FBI, Uh, they were holding up uh, supermarkets, and, and, you know, she she drove the getaway car, in fact, in this this supermarket robbery that occurred in 1969, and and her life just became this series of, of sad incidents where she was uh, uh, working with or on behalf of criminals and and for the leaders of, of this cult. Um, you know, Maury Terry mentioned specifically that uh, at some point she and another couple of members of the cult had traveled to Montreal, Canada. Uh, at the behest of the Process Church to make a connection with the QLF, which was a terrorist separatist organization in Montreal, a French Canadian uh, separatist group, and he, you know, he, he noted that that uh, that was what the Process did. They made connections with other groups who were prone to violence. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I didn't realize until just a couple of weeks ago, actually, uh, because I'm still doing research on this, that. Um, I, I knew that, that two of the three cult members who, who went on this mission were Suzanne Conway and Ralph Marcel. Um, Ralph Marcel was also a member of the Process Church. His, his title in the church was Brother Ed, because everybody got these titles, you know, Brother This or Father That. 
and Marcel's title was Brother Ed, but I didn't realize until recently that Ralph Marceau was, had been Suzanne Conway's common-law husband, her second common-law husband, in fact, so that they were actually together uh, for a period when they both belonged to the, to the cult and were doing you know work for the Process Church, and they apparently were a couple when, when they went on this Montreal mission. Um, and in the course of finding this out, I, I discovered some, some pretty interesting things about Ralph Marcel, too. Now, he, he was one of a number of people involved with the cult who died under mysterious circumstances after David Berkowitz's arrest, because this is like at least a couple of dozen people connected to the cult who died mysteriously, you know, um, after the Son of Sam case was officially closed. But Marcel, <clears throat> excuse me, he had been he, he was killed in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. He was hit by a car. It was ruled an accident, but Maury Terry noted that the person who drove the car was from Long Island. Um, I've never been able to find out the specifics of that incident, but but anyway, we know that Marcel was killed, uh, run down by a car in Florida. But at the time that he was killed, he was living in Georgia, in a little town that was about a two-hour drive from Atlanta. And as I'm, I'm sure you know, and, and probably a lot of your listeners know, um, Maury Terry had found evidence to indicate that after David Berkowitz's arrest, after the Son of Sam case was officially closed, the remnants of the Process Church left Manhattan, left their Manhattan offices, and relocated to Atlanta, and that there was, you know, there were strong indications that they were also involved in the Atlanta child murders. Mm. Uh, now, it, it, it came as a surprise to me that Ralph Marcel had been living in Georgia so close to the scene of that particular case, uh, but also he was killed just a month after the Atlanta child murders ended, and I wondered if he might have played some role in that along with other members of the process, but I, I found it very interesting that, that that's where he wound up and that's where he was living when he was killed. Yeah, if only Cisco Street Love was still alive to talk to you. He wrote the book Yesterday's Shame. I did several shows with him, uh, along with uh, uh, former Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, who was also on a show with me and Cisco. And he actually grew up with those kids in, in the Atlanta Child Murders. He was very intimately aware of all that the child prostitution was going on with that entire group, and he concurs uh, with your theory about the process show, uh, called Connection. I would need to pick up that book and read it. I remember yeah. hearing a couple of your interviews with him, but I've never read the book. I'd, I'd really like to read that. Yeah. Yeah, very passionate fellow who's gone. Again, another one who, who's passed on. Yeah, yeah. I've, so many have. It, it, it's really uh, um, almost unbelievable when, when you see how many people who are not just connected to the case, but people who have researched it are, are no longer with us. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and like you said, too, uh, I don't know if you mentioned it too, but... Uh, but Jim Rothstein, Detective Jim Rothstein, also agrees with this, uh, the Atlanta Child Murder Connection. Uh, what, right. what, what about other things that were going on in Yonkers, though, like Dart Man and these other kind of things? Well, it's, it's a funny thing, I, and I've read about Dart Man, and, and it, it certainly seems to have the, the potential to have been connected to, to the Son of Sam case. And, and the details of it are just so bizarre. You, you try to imagine who, who dreamed of this idea to go around. You know, shooting women with with these darts, but mm. it, it, it certainly sounds like something that, that that could have been connected to to this larger cult activity. Right, and also too, Maury uh, was convinced that Aton Pates. Uh, the the murder of Aton Pates was connected to this cult as well, and and also too that uh, 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 Hedda Nussbaum and the murder of Little Lisa Steinberg, uh, that Little Lisa right. Steinberg was taken to Roy Radin's mansion, uh, and other uh, people associated with these cults and stuff. So it's, it's not some small operation. No, no, it, it, I, I think it was a sustained thing, and I think it continued to um, the, the events continued to. Yeah. occur uh, after Son of Santa, you know, no matter what the further process connection might have been, because like we we were just talking about, they, they at least officially, they all relocated to Atlanta, the, the, the remnants of, of the, the church that were in Manhattan in 1978. But, but uh, you know, even in the late 70s and early 80s, there, there were still some very strange, in fact, some of the strangest stuff connected to the, to the larger case happened after Berkowitz was arrested. You know, there, there were still uh, 
victims who were dying in very strange ways. There were still uh, rituals being conducted, uh, like this thing that happened at uh, at the Stillwell estate that a, that a state cop ran up on this, this ritual where uh, there were people chanting, and there was a guy wearing a red cape, and he had two German shepherds on, on chains. And, and so in some form, uh, even after the process were gone, uh, uh, this cult activity in, in Yonkers continued. And, and one of the, the known patterns of this group in Yonkers was the, the slaughter, the sacrifice of German shepherds, correct? That's right, yes. And ultimately, the leaders of the Process Church of the Final Judgment uh, today currently run a huge animal rescue. Uh, <laughs> you know, a dog rescue. You know, they, they they do. Do. That's right. What a yeah, remarkable they kill animal shelter. <laughs> what, what, what a, a remarkable coincidence. And uh, when, when you look into this uh, organization, they're, they're shipping dogs back and forth across the country seems to be their greatest expense. Uh, I, I can't understand why you would have to ship dogs back and forth across the country uh, to rescue them when there's local local dogs everywhere <laughs> you know, to be rescued. Makes no sense to me. And, and also, too, the same group, the Process Church of the Final Judge, at one point they changed their name to the Final I had their son. I had one of their sons on the show, by the way. Forget oh, his. Wow. oh no, yeah, and uh, and after the show, and he was telling me all the stuff about how they made him build these dog cages over there in Utah. <laughs> he was all pissed off about it. And after the show, I says, "Hey, have you ever seen that picture of uh, when they were called the Foundation? They were in there with George Wallace in the governor's office, and they're praying over him. They got these robes and pentagrams on their chest." All right. And he, right. he goes, "No, I've never seen that." <laughs> so I says, after the show, I send it to him. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's so-and-so, that's so-and-so. That, he knew everybody in that picture. So uh... it, it's very and, – and see, uh, despite the fact that they, they run a no-kill animal shelter now, I don't think people's motivations change that radically. No, no. I think if, if their motivations were always bad, then they're still bad. They may not be doing, like, the, the blood and guts Satan stuff that, that they once were into, like the really overt, but, but they're, they're still up to no good, I, I believe. Yeah, there's actually a, there was a news article once about a fellow who was busted at the bus stop across the street from that operation for child pornography, uh, and and if you look where the headquarters is, it's in the middle of nowhere, so I don't know who's out there waiting for a bus other than someone perhaps looking for a puppy right. <laughs> to take home yeah. to take home yeah. on the bus, <laughs> looking for a stray dog. And we we have a friend too who has a whole theory about because uh, this is one of the groups that has. Um, uh, encourage pit bulls, you know, the, the propagation of pit bulls. And right. she, she has a whole theory about all the deaths and maimings that go on every year by pit bulls and how this is also uh, by design. Uh, when you start dabbling into all this stuff and then trying mm -hmm. to figure out what's going on, uh, and when you consider people like Michael Aquino, you know, head of this army, first chaplain, you know, a satanic chaplain, wrote, by the way, wrote the, 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 the chaplain's guideline for all religions in the U.S. Army have to follow the guidelines written by an avowed Satanist, a public Satanist. Um, oh, yeah, it's bizarre. It, uh, it's totally bizarre. Does any of this make uh, sense I, I to anybody? I don't think people realize how woven into the fabric of just normal life and normal existence this stuff has become. Yeah. Yeah, it's so Wh true. Which works to their advantage, of course, because it, it just uh, 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 it, it's always better to to be woven into the fabric of everyday existence than, than to have to operate covertly under rocks and bushes. And, and you know, so, so that, that absolutely works to their advantage. Yeah, and it seems like they have access to these psychological studies, like you said, going way back, these uh, uh, mass manipulation techniques and mind control and brainwashing propaganda. It seems to be all in the same thread. Uh, Mr. Mitchell. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Jonathan Mitchell. We're, we're just about out of time. It's flown by. Uh, first because we have a few minutes. Is there anything you want the audience to know that I haven't asked you? No, I, I think we've covered most of uh, most of the high points. Uh, one thing that I did want to mention with regard to the Process Church and their, their transformation into this uh, this no-kill animal shelter yeah. is this, the apparent significance of the number 22 to these people. And, and we're talking also, of course, about the reference in the son of Sam Breslin letter to a group called the 22 Disciples of Hell. Right. Uh, well, when the Process Church left England in 1966 to go to, uh, well, eventually to Mexico, but, but first in the Bahamas, uh, so when they first uh, uh, came to the Americas, there were 22 of them. 
this was the inner circle of this group. There were 22 members, um, and I believe that has some significant relation to this reference to the 22 disciples of hell in the Breslin letter, but also even many, many years later when they transformed into this animal shelter, when Michael Vick was arrested and his fighting dogs were, were mm. confiscated, they rescued specifically 22 dogs from his property. No more, no less than that. They, they, and that. This was actually reported in their newsletter at the time, 22 dogs. So I don't know what the name 22 or the number 22 means to them or what, what the cult significance that has, uh, but apparently it, it, it does have some uh, long-term significance to them. Yeah, just fascinating. There's a lot of numerology and dates and, and all kind of the <laughs> – uh, even like the steps, the, the Saturn steps up there in, in Untermeyer Park, you know, it's all Saturn worship and all kinds of uh, uh, specifics right. and numerology and all kinds of things involved in it. Uh, Mr. Jonathan Mitchell, author of the book uh, Before Son of Sam, The Submerged History of a Yonkers Cult. You can get it on Amazon.com. Uh, we've got about one minute. What, what would you like to leave us with? Um, I guess just... Um I, I guess I'd like to say again that it, I'm, I'm really heartened by the fact that people are still so interested and mm -hmm. that there are so many good investigators out there working on this case. And um, I, I, I think that there are a lot of uh, uh, that there's a lot of dedication and a lot of sincerity. And, and I think this case is still crackable. And I think we're going to crack it. Oh, you got a lot more confidence than me, my friend. You're a lot more optimistic. Because <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, I've been doing this a long time. And I, I'm, one day I'm going to write a book called The More I Learn, The Less I Know. Uh, because the more I, I delve into these topics and I talk to people about them, it just, the, it, the hole gets deeper. The more I dig, the hole gets deeper. Um, and it just seems like these, so many of these people are untouchable and uh, have all the media behind them, the, the Netflix TV shows and all that kind of stuff. And. And all that kind of stuff, uh, Jonathan oh, Mitchell. Uh, yeah, it yeah. definitely does get discouraging, but but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm at least with regard to this, I'm I'm still an optimist. So, well, that's so we'll, great, we'll, man. We'll keep working at it. I and I do want to have you come back. Let's do a a, a Patreon show uh, for people that are more into the details and, and really want to get into the, to the behind the scenes, back and forth here. Before Son of yeah. Sam, the submerged history of a Yonkers cult. Jonathan Mitchell, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Ed. I appreciate it. No, thank you. Good night.